Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry explanation video about ceramics, polymers and composites. In this video we'll take a look at those three different types of material, look at some properties they typically have and then explore why that property makes them suitable for a particular use. When we want to build an object, we need to make sure that the materials we select for that object have the properties that the object requires. Properties are characteristics or qualities that describe how a substance will behave or react in different situations. Properties can be physical properties, such as the colour of the substance, whether it is hard, strong, dense, the melting point and boiling point, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, whether something is flexible, malleable, ductile. All of these are physical properties. Other properties are called chemical properties, and this is more to do with the reactivity of a substance, whether it easily oxidizes or corrodes, is it flammable? And we can also have biological properties such as a toxicity or the biodegradability of a substance. In an exam situation, you might be asked to match a material to an object that needs to be made. And in making your selection, you're matching a property that this material has and explaining why that's necessary for the object. So maybe you're making a saucepan. You need the base of that saucepan to be made of metal so it can conduct heat and it will have a high melting point. But the handle will be made from an insulating material, for instance wood, because then it will stay cool while it's being used. Ceramics are non-metallic solids with a whole variety of different uses based on their properties. In general, they have got high melting points and they are poor thermal conductors and poor electrical conductors. Also, they generally tend to be brittle, which means that they aren't flexible and they can break if put under pressure. They will shatter. There are two types of ceramics that you need to know about. You need to know about clay ceramics and glass. If we start with glass, glass in general has the obvious property of being transparent, which means that we can see through it. Most of the glass that we use is soda lime glass. And this is made by mixing together sand, sodium carbonate and limestone and heating it up and then casting it or blowing it into a particular shape that we can then use for something such as windows. Alternatively, there is something called borosilicate glass. This is also made from sand, but it's made with boron trioxide instead of the sodium carbonate and limestone. As a result of this, we get a type of glass that has got a much higher melting point. And this means that we can use this glass in positions where the temperature will raise higher than you might expect. For instance, using it in cookware that needs to go into an oven. Normal glass might melt at the temperatures that an oven might reach, but this borosilicate glass does not. When somebody mentions ceramics, they're normally talking about clay ceramics. And as the name suggests, clay ceramics are made from the raw material of clay. What you do is you take some clay, which is dug up from the ground, and we shape it while it is wet. Once it's in the shape that we want it to have, we heat it to a high temperature in a furnace, and that makes the material harden. Once we've done this, the ceramics are very, very hard substances, and they also have a high melting point. This gives them a variety of different uses. Bricks is an obvious one. This is one of the most common uses of ceramics that we see every day. We need those bricks to be extremely hard substances so they can withstand the pressure of being used as a building material. Also pottery, they keep their shape really well and they can retain their shape at whatever the temperature. So ceramic cookware that might go into an oven, also an important use of ceramics. Composites are a special type of material made from two substances that have been combined together. That's a helpful way of thinking about that because 
composites sounds like, the combination of substances. Now, the two different substances are referred to as the matrix, which is helpful to think of as the main stuff that is making up the material, and then something else that runs through the substance and reinforces it. And this substance is known as a reinforcement. There are a huge variety of composite materials and the property that the composite materials have depends on what the matrix is or what the reinforcement is. And so as a result, we can get many different uses for composite materials. For instance, the most common composite material in a GCSE question is fiberglass. In this instance, the matrix or the, the binder that holds the substance together is some kind of resin, normally polyester. And then the reinforcement that runs through it is literally fibres made from glass. This material is normally very strong, certainly lightweight and normally resistant to corrosion. And as such, this makes it really useful for things such as boats, aircraft and car bodywork. Another example of a composite material is carbon fibre. Again, the matrix is a form of resin. This time it's normally an, an epoxy resin. And then carbon fibres or carbon nanotubes run through the material and provide the extra strength. And carbon fibre is an extremely strong material and normally very lightweight and stiff. And as a result of those properties, the composites are useful for aerospace, sports equipment and high performance vehicles as well. Another type of composite that occurs quite regularly in exam situations is concrete. In concrete, the matrix is the cement, which can be used by itself. But when you've got the reinforcement of extra materials such as crushed up stone or gravel or sand, that makes the concrete much more durable and strong. And also it has the added property of being fire resistant. And so concrete is, of course, a very popular building material and it's used for roads and bridges as well. There are many, many more types of composites, so many that you can't possibly be expected to know them all. What you need to be able to do is think on your feet when faced with a list of properties and match those properties to a potential use. So, for instance, a more obscure composite is a composite of wood and plastic. In this instance, the matrix is a thermoplastic, more about that later, and the reinforcements are fibres of wood running through this plastic, and when that plastic sets hard, you end up with a very durable, water-resistant material that requires very little maintenance because it doesn't corrode. And this makes it a really useful composite for outdoor furniture, decking, fencing. It's really growing in popularity because of that low maintenance requirement. There is an absolutely huge variety of polymers that we utilise in our day-to-day -day lives, some of which occur naturally and some are synthetic. What they all have in common is that they are all very long molecules that are formed when a large number of small molecules called monomers join together. These long chained polymers are held together by covalent bonds between the atoms that make a sort of a backbone for the whole molecule. And these bonds are really, really strong, which normally affects some of the properties of these polymers because these covalent bonds are hard to break. The huge variety of different polymers comes from two sources. Firstly, the selection of the monomer that you use to make the polymer. It makes sense that if you use a different monomer, a different building material to make that polymer chain, then the polymer that you produce will be different and so it will have different properties. Something that makes a little bit less sense, it seems less obvious, but the conditions that you use during the polymerization process, that's the process of making the polymer, can also have a big impact on the properties that the polymer will have. In general, the large majority of polymers will be low 
thermal conductivity and low electrical conductivity to the point of being considered to be insulators. They're normally pretty flexible and sometimes you can mould them into a particular shape which allows you to make very specific products as a result. And there are two types of polymer that get covered in a different topic in chemistry. They are addition polymers, which are formed when alkenes combine together using that double bond to help them to react and join. And condensation polymers, which makes things such as polyesters and polyamides that are useful in clothing and cookware and all sorts of other different items as well. One of the reasons why the type of monomer has such an impact on the properties of the polymer is that during the process of polymerization, sometimes connections can form between the polymer chains themselves. Now, these connections are sometimes called crosslinks, but what they normally are is a type of bond, and that might be a covalent bond or an ionic bond. It depends on the monomer. And so the specific groups of atoms in the monomer influences the polymer chain that gets produced. And then the presence of these atoms in one polymer chain that can form a bond to atoms in another polymer chain means that these crosslinks will form between the polymer chains. And these crosslinks have a huge impact on the properties of the polymer. They could potentially make the polymer stronger and more rigid, but a particularly important property that you need to know about is that crosslinks affect the melting point of a polymer and, in fact, its very ability to melt altogether. And the class of chemical that gets these crosslinks is usually referred to as a thermosetting polymer. And what that means is once that polymer has set, it will not change when it is heated because these crosslinks will not break upon heating. We use thermosetting polymers in any situations where the polymer might have experience of a high temperature. A good example of this might be something in the electrical wiring system, perhaps a plug socket. When plugs are plugged in, the temperature can get quite high and in certain types of polymers, this might cause the plug to melt. And this is obviously what we do not want to happen. And so we choose a thermosetting plastic that is able to withstand this raised temperature. What will happen to this type of polymer is it will typically char instead of melting. And so that's sometimes what you see on a plug or a plug socket that has got hot. It goes a bit yellow because the plastic has charred. It's changed colour and perhaps shape slightly. Thermosoftening polymers are substances where there aren't any crosslinks between the polymer chains. That means that thermosoftening polymers are made up of strands that don't really have strong connections to the other polymers in a substance. All they have is intermolecular forces that are quite weak. Since the chains themselves are very long, this buildup of intermolecular forces is such that the melting point of the polymer will be above room temperature, but perhaps not much above room temperature, maybe 60 degrees C. As a result of this, it is normally quite easy to melt a thermosoftening plastic and remould it. This is a really useful property that thermosoftening polymers will have, and it will mean that you can recycle this material because once the polymers have been collected and sorted, you can heat them and they will melt, and then you can remold them into a new substance, a new shape, a new material. This lack of crosslinks affects other properties of the polymer. Typically, they are more flexible and less rigid in their nature, and that makes them useful for things such as carrier bags or anything that needs to have more give in it in order for it to perform its function. In GCSE chemistry, there is one named example of a polymer that you need to know, and this polymer is polyethene, sometimes just referred to as polythene in day-to-day -day lives. Polyethene is made from the monomer ethene, and we have a huge number of these monomers, so huge but variable, we use the letter N to signify a very large number of this 
alkene. We know it's an alkene because it's got the C to C double bond as its functional group. And this double bond is very, very reactive and it can break partially and become a single bond. And then all of these monomers can join together in a big, big, long row that will repeat n times, where n is how many monomers have joined together. And what's inside the brackets is referred to as the repeating unit. And once we've got the brackets and the trailing bond and the n, that is referred to as the polymer. There are in fact two different types of polyethene and which type you get depends on the conditions that you use for the polymerization reaction. You can get low density polyethene and that's formed when we use high temperatures and under a high pressure as well and we get a flexible polymer that is really, really useful for things such as carrier bags and for plastic drinks bottles, water bottles that need to have a little bit of give in them. And then there is also high density polyethene and that forms at a much, much lower temperature and a lower pressure as well. And we're able to use those conditions because this process uses a catalyst. And remember, catalysts lower the activation energy required for a reaction without being used up. And that means that the reaction happens faster and we can use a lower temperature as a result. The high density polyethene is much more rigid and generally stronger. And so it's useful for packaging material and carrying boxes and things like that, where that rigidity is really, really useful. And in terms of the polymer chains, low density and high density, density is how much matter, how much mass is packed into a particular volume. And so a low density polymer means that there's probably quite a bit of space between the polymer chains themselves. Whereas high density means that the polymer chains are held closer together. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.